Now, here we are. This is um, going to be a walkthrough and Q&A session about my midterm deliverable number one. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, of course, I should have done this before the video started, but your first deliverable is due the 20th of February. You might want to make a note. That's almost exactly midterm. Then we will have in-class demos like this where you get to use my computer and show stuff on the screen. The demos will be the 21st, which is a Wednesday, and the 22 days later, one, two, three, 23rd. And I'll draw names out of a cup. So seven people will go the first day, seven people will go the second day. Not only will I draw names out of a cup, you get to do a little, approximately five minute, uh, walkthrough of all the wonderful things you've done on your app up to that point. And then I'll draw a question out of the cup that's roughly along the same lines as the kind of questions you get on the watch guides. And you, you get to show us in your code uh, that one specific example, whatever it may be. It might be just a custom view that you built for part of the app. Uh, it could be a particular syntax thing like an enum. Oh, using your code, explain what an enum is. And I picked that on purpose. If you get something and you don't have it in your code and you can't demo it, you get to draw up the two additional questions beyond that until you get one you like. If you don't like any of the three, you gotta take your best shot at the third one. But any questions that are not answered go back into the cup. So if you do have an answer and someone before you didn't, then you get a chance. And if none of that makes any sense, then don't worry about it. I'll draw names uh, a week before we have to start the demos and I'll refresh your memories on how all this demo stuff is gonna proceed. But that does count a bigger chunk of points than just a regular increment or even a group of increments for the week. Now, where are we? Here we are, um, word game, uh, five, increment seven, deliverable. It's been, as you can see, several days since I've done this, so I don't even know that I can remember everything I was supposed to say about it. Let's start with the files and the full screen. And I'll just go through this a file at a time. I don't even remember what order I did all this. I've never changed the, the word game app. Told you that. Symbolic constants, I do have more symbolic constants. Um, what, do I have more comments up here? Oh, I do. I, I, I put a HTML comment up here. The keyboard keys have been square up to this point. I don't know if you can remember. But I wanted them to look more like actual Wordle. So I went back and forth to the Wordle app, on, up, well, the, the, the word guess app online. Excuse me. And it has keyboard keys that look more like uh, what I thought of as the golden rectangle. That's a, a thing from art, the perfect rectangle. So I looked up what the ratio was. And custom colors, I also tried to get the color a little closer to Wordle. So a lot of this is just cosmetic stuff. I think I might have changed the corner radius, but who knows. I did put in comments, since this is going to be my deliberal, deliberal, deliberable, I wanted to be a good role model for you and for myself and actually put comments. Where com I don't know that you have to have one for every single symbolic constant. Maybe you can group together a bunch of them. But don't turn in files without comments. Um, not just uh, so that you can get more credit for your app, but when I, some people do send me apps. Here I go complain again, I'm sorry. But some people do send me apps and say I don't have any idea how this works and there is not a comment to be found. And I, I can't tell what's supposed to be where. So comments absolutely are a communication device between people that really are not fully on top of Swift UI yet. So any little bit helps when it comes to trying to figure out what's going on. All the letters of the alphabet, and I just looked at the keyboard and pecked them in one at a time, so there's nothing magic there. What else we got? Oh, I set up color. I made a gray, I looked that up, but um, the stuff that's, that I looked up just by, you know, option clicking on color, and it takes me to where I can specify um, blue and green and red components and so forth, I did not put HTML links to that. So you can assume that anything like that that just appeared out of nowhere, there is no way I know how to do that already. I write uh, option clicked on color, and it told me that I could set the RGB components, which I chose to do to make the light gray, and there is the result of my uh, intense research into the golden rectangle, that's the, the keyboard aspect ratio. Remember, 1.0 made it a square. This makes it a rectangle, as you shall see. You know what, as soon as I'm done with symbolic constants, I should run it, so you can map what I'm saying about these files back to what we're seeing. Here's the current state, at this point, of the in-class version of the Word Game app. 
any minute now. And some people still are not telling me what device you're using. And when I run it, I can tell that's not what it looked like for you when you ran it because some of them don't look good at all. This is uh, sort of like the Wordle keyboard. It's actually a little bit lighter gray, but it's easier for me to see that way, so I chose to do that. And also, I don't know if you can tell with the big screen up there, I also use dot gradient. Dot gradient, all that does is make it gradual. It makes it look, I don't know, a little, a little more sophisticated, a little more professional. So I've got a keyboard looking keyboard down here that's very similar to the actual Wordle. If I go clicking on this stuff here, well, let me get this back over so we can see. Shrink. I, I'm still doing um, console messages out to Wazoo because that's how I keep up with what's going on. But I'm, I'm clicking stuff here, and you can tell that even though it's uh, registering what row number I'm on, it says, yikes, wrong row, can't, I can't set a letter. Wrong row, wrong row, wrong row, wrong row, toy boat. T, I selected a T, can we go here? No, how about here? Now mine is upside down from yours. Yours should enable the bottom row, and mine enables the top row. I, did I say T? I didn't mean T. I can change it, and I want an animal named Omo. So I click OMO. Now all of a sudden this row, this is remember uh, related to your increment seven, all of a sudden this row is in, in it disabled. So if I wanted to say OMP, I'm clicking on P, and it's too late but I can set P on the second row, and so on. So the second row was enabled. Now I click on H, I guess it is, and I can't set any of these to an H, I can't set any of these to an H, but I can set that to an H. Does all this ring true? Do you recognize all that stuff? That's what this version of the app does, and if you have questions about this, how I did it or what's going on there, that's what I meant by it'd be great to ask those questions as we're going through this, because that's what this code does right here after symbolic any question about the symbolic constants file I do recommend having one I don't require it but I do recommend having a symbolic constants file it's just a a nice sort of clearing house to put all the stuff that um, you want to be able to change in one fell swoop throughout the project who's next after that comes I guess the model proper here's the model proper what have I got? I forgot. I, we already did that, making a rectangle square. How to change the font size, I already did that. Do we do this? Current row number no longer, oh, I, I think this is new. The current row number, I think I started that off in the older versions of the app as an optional. Except the current row number is always going to start with zero. So that was, uh, maybe that was an interesting illustration of using optionals at the beginning, but it's outlived its usefulness. So I changed that from an optional to just being a plain old integer and a couple of new functions uh, in general. I don't think we need comments like that. That actually was note to self, so I'd remember to say something about them. I've got a new function named row is full and next row. And remember, this is in the model and sprinkled with new comments, initialize, I don't know how much of this is new or not, the init function initializes everything, the letter options, which was the poor choice of name for the keyboard keys, and the set of user guesses, that's all the different guesses the user might do. Record a keyboard tap, is this, is it, let me see, I don't think that's new. This is new, row is full, there's a row full of letters. Well, uh, let's see. If row less than max guesses return, whether or not it's full. So I asked the, rather than going through and looping through here, I left that up to the user guess row. That's its own business, whether it's full or not. So I'm more or less just asking it by accessing this computed variable here. And if it's not less than max guesses, I'll always return false. There were some problems with that where the game kept running after the entire game board was full. Not everybody, but some problems. And you don't want that to happen. After they've guessed all their guesses, they don't get to go back and change anything else. Um, next row, this is new. I think this is, well, it's a replacement for that. This needs to go. We're not letting the user choose a row anymore. The next row is gonna happen automatically, in my case, as a result of an enter key. Yours might be with a go button or an enter key or whatever. But the user, through accessing views in the interface, is going to 
fill up a row, and then when they say, okay, I mean it now, and they press the enter key, which is the equivalent, I can refer back now to the tournament, the equivalent of telling your opponent, okay, that's it, that's my guess. That's what you're doing with the app. You get a chance to change it any way you want until the user taps the enter key or the go button or whatever we're calling it here. So here's, what have we got here? If user guesses uh, of the current row is full, I'm not gonna move to the next one unless it's full, and the row number is less than max guesses. That keeps me from trying to run off the top or anything like that. So both of those have to be true. Then I set current row to current row plus one. And notice this was not selected by the user. That automatically happens. And the model says what's going on. If either of those, if either of those is false, either the current row is not full or we are already up at maximum guesses, then no, I'm not going to change the current row. And I, I meant to test to see if there were calls to this, and I forgot, but this is probably going to get deleted. So good. Um, is this new? Set a letter and a user's guess, set guess letter. Um, it's probably been modified since last we saw it. But this is when, in the model, the user has uh, signified their intent by tapping on, uh, in my case, a letter, and it should set it to the current letter. In your case, they'll tap on one of the guest beads. Please put your electronic devices away. Um, you can tap on one of the guest beads and it should change it to the current color. And I know there were some struggles with that. I hope those have been cleared up. But uh, the model is trying to set letter in a particular guess. If the row that they're tr clicked on, this is actually checking to see. Now, the set guest letter, let me back up. The set guest letter gets the row in the column regardless of whether or not it's on the current row. So that's why the model is checking to make sure that it's the current row before it proceeds and actually sets a letter on that guess. If we are, if the user did tap on the current row and it's a valid, well, of course it's a valid column, there's not much choice there, then it sets uh, user guesses guess item to the current letter. And I don't know how, your memory's prob probably better than mine, but this is the entire set, an array of all of the user guesses and we're on a particular one at this time, the row. And if it's full, no, look at this. If the row is full, it goes to the next row. Um, that's that's going to have to go. That call to the next row, mental note, that's going to have to go when we have an enter key because the user gets the chance to change their mind even if it is full. But for now, but for now, as of increment seven, all it had to do was detect if the row was full and then automatically go to the next row. And if they clicked on anything else, then yikes, uh, wrong row, can't set a letter. This is new. Question on that? And I'm sorry just to dump all this stuff on you that's new, but it's, maybe it's better than suffering through my insufferable typing. Letter option, that's not new. Identifiable for guests, that's, is that, is that new? I don't think so. Oh, this the is full. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I, I said it was a computed property, and here it is, computed variable. Um, this is new, this function right here. Well, not function, it's a variable. It's hard for me to tell the difference. But is full is Boolean. It just loops through with a standard for loop. If it finds nil anywhere, it immediately returns false. There's no reason to check all of them. If it makes it through the entire letter guess count, which in my case is three, in your case it'd be four, if it gets through the whole thing and doesn't find an empty one, then it'll return true, because they're all full. That was new. Any question on that? Zipping right along. That was the model. Next up, oh boy, the content view. I do all mine, by the way. I work on mine in the order of model, view, content view, because that way I can remember which ones I've worked on. I mean, you don't have to do anything like that, but that's the name of the design pattern, MVVM, and for no better reason than that. Whoa, way up here at the top. What do we got? Oh, I've got a new comment here. Oh! <laughs> Someone said this last time. I believe, Ms. Edwards, I think you did that. I uh, said, all you gotta do is put in self to get rid of that the stupid error message in the for each, remember for each, was complaining because I didn't have a constant range. It doesn't matter whether you remember or not. But if you put dot self in there for no good reason, 
then it will stop it. And I found that on hacking with Swift. Of course, that's a good place to find stuff. But I didn't, I didn't intentionally search hacking with Swift. I just Googled it. I'll show it to you when we get down there. There's nothing new to see here. The, the view model is an observed object. Um, some new comments to try to make it look, oh, I forgot. That's supposed to be a symbolic constant. OK, that gives you something easy to criticize on my first deliverable. Dr. England, put your money where your mouth is. Use symbolic constants. You could print out a copy and then write it on red. Symbolic constant. That'll be payback. Um, that for each loops through the array. There's nothing. Uh, this, is, this is also horrible. My goodness. I'm, I should hide my face in shame, except I won't be able to see the screen. When I made the full keyboard, uh, I did it one row at a time. And the only thing that's different among the rows, look at this. Here's the top row. Here's the middle row. What's different? Do you like number one, number two, or maybe number three? When you have duplicate code like that, you should either split it off and make it a separate structure or split it off and make it a function. And I intend to do that. But I ran out of clock time as well. So I just left it uh, redundant like this. The only thing different is this one goes in a loop from 0 to 10. This one goes from 10 to 19. And this one goes from 19 to 26. Three separate H stacks. And for, uh, to refresh your memory, that's three separate H stacks down here. It's just one array of letters written as strings. And they, I split them up. Otherwise, it tried to squeeze all letters of the alphabet into one row. Of course, it did. So that's what that's all about, except that's just ugly code to have so much code. It looks more complicated. And I guess people that aren't as enlightened as we are might be impressed by it. But I'm not impressed by it myself, because um, that needs to be split off. Well, how many times am I going to say split off? Oh, the fixed size thing, too. Um, I'm having a flashback of awful trial and error. That was another um, option click when, when I was having trouble getting things to look correct on the screen. One row would be bigger. What it did was, if I can remember correctly, the, the, the um, keyboard rows that had more letters, those were smaller. And then the one beneath it that had um, fewer letters, they were bigger. We don't want that. We want, we, don't, we want all the keys on the keyboard to be the same size. So I went back, and this works. You can't ask me why. Well, you can ask me why, but I'll tell you, have to tell you I don't know. All I know is it does work, and that's the result of yet more trial and error. Do not underestimate the power of trial and error, especially in the view. So far, so good. Um, I've got, what else? This is the view, letter guess view. Letter guess view. There's a letter in this position. I've got something in circles here, but I don't know where that changed. No letter here yet. No? I, I think I went past it already. This, letter option view, also known as a keyboard key. Oh, uh, you might not have noticed, but the keys originally had strokes around them. They were all outlined in black, and they're not anymore. Now they're not outlined with anything at all. That's why it's zero for the stroke, unless it is selected. If it's selected, then it's, uh, it's got a highlight around it. And I'll demonstrate that, going back to the code. That, I took the black outline away from all the keys. So now if I click on one, such as the H, for example, it outlines it in black or the R. So there's only one selected at one time. That's the current letter that will go in the square. OK? I'm re refreshing my own memory as I look through this. Um, I think we're getting close. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? No, not yet. Oh, this is whether or not there's a letter in the guest view. Come on. Oh, here it is. This is where I was getting the, the warning, the ugly warning. For each, zero dot dot letter guess count. It didn't like my symbolic constant. Letter guess count was three. This, for absolutely no apparent reason, to me at least, if you put comma, id colon slash dot self, it suppresses that warning. And I'm trying to be a good little student of Swift UI, according to the Stanford videos. And you might recall he wove in there, get rid of all the warnings as well. 
not just the errors. Find out what's underneath the warning and get rid of it. Down the line, I think he mentions that again in later videos and said, you know, as you develop your app, as you move further, warnings tend to turn into errors. And I think that's probably true. So I don't know if this particular one would have turned into a flat out error, but I still want to get rid of the warning. And bada boom, bada bing, we are at the bottom of the view. Any questions? The view model, did anything change? Um, comments, I put more comments in. There were not comments on every function, now there are comments on every function. And is that it? I think that's all of them. Okay, bada boom, bada bing. Any questions? Oh, I have, I'll answer a question. Quit Xcode. Nobody stopped me, so that is it. That is our deliverable. So how do I turn in my deliverable? Now, at some, some point in your file folder, ideally in developer, but it doesn't have to be, all of these directories are the different versions of the project. See all these? I don't want all of those right now. I'm not gonna upload all of those. You're welcome. I'm only gonna uh, upload the one that we just now looked at. So watch this. I'm going to right click, I believe it is on that folder, compress, and it makes a zip file. Did everybody see what I did there? Let me trash that. This is the folder. This is the folder that has the word game folder in it that has all the source code files, all the project files except for the main one. This, this is like the over, overarching Xcode project file that keeps up with where all the directories are and everything else. So we need this whole package. Don't right click on Word game and zip that and send it. Don't copy Xcode project into Word game and zip that and send it. At the top level, right click, compress, it makes a zip folder. This is what you will send to Dr. England as an attachment to an email. Does anybody have a question about that step? And this is exactly what I will upload to Canvas but I'm not in the mood to jump through all the hoops to do that right this minute, so I ain't gonna. I think ain't gonna is a great phrase to end the video on, but I've kept talking, so maybe. I, I will. Does anybody want to see this demo again? Well, you can ask, but I ain't gonna.